Hi, I'm Steve Clements, and I have a question. 2021 wasn't exactly the best year for democracy around the world. So is Joe Biden's summit for democracy supposed to come in and save the day? Let's get to the bottom line. U.S. President Joe Biden had barely arrived at the White House last February when he announced that he'd hold a summit for democracy in December. He said the idea was to defend democracies against the spread of authoritarianism, fight corruption, and promote respect for human rights. It's been a year where six coups have already thrown out civilian leaders in countries ranging from Sudan to Myanmar. China's leaders and Russia's leaders look like they're outperforming Biden on a lot of fronts, and democracy looks like it's gasping in the boxing ring after taking a lot of punches. Can it prevail? Even in the United States, the year started out with angry mobs attacking Congress to try to overturn the results of the presidential election. Authoritarians are on the march worldwide, and they're taking advantage of people's frustrations, centralizing control, and suppressing dissent. People around the world are not so sure that democracy makes their lives better. Now, more than 100 heads of state have been invited to Joe Biden's virtual summit. But besides speeches, what's it going to be? Who's invited to the club? Who's left out? What does success even look like? And does Washington have the moral authority to lecture folks about democracy? That's what we're talking about today with Ambassador Daniel Fried, who served as one of America's top diplomats to Europe for decades, serving under both Republican and Democratic presidents. He's a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council. Elise Labatt is columnist for Foreign Policy magazine, and she's the founder of Zivi Media, a platform for debate on international affairs. Check it out. And David Adler, a political economist who's worked on the foreign policy team of Senator Bernie Sanders and is the coordinator of the Progressive International. Um, Ambassador Fried, it's great to have you with us. Great to have you all with us today. But let me just start with you. Explain to our audience what this summit, this summit for democracy, is supposed to achieve. What's it about? I think Biden is essentially right. Democracies need to get their act together. They need to rally because the world's dictators are rallying themselves. Okay, you're right. 2021, bad year for democracy. What do we do about that? Give up? Throw up our hands? Biden remembers the 1930s. He wasn't alive then, but it's, it's more of a, a, a real memory for him than it is for the younger generation of Americans. He knows what happens when democracies lack self-confidence confidence and are passive. Disaster. So I think the Summit for Democracy is a great idea. Ah, but implementing it. Yuck. Many pitfalls. Okay? Many traps. Many problems. I think the Biden administration can pull it off, but it's not going to be easy. Still, worth a try. But I, I guess my question, you just take a step further, is a lot is done under the tent of democracy. And if you look at the United States, for example, where we had the insurrection, you had an attack on the Capitol, we've had growing inequality in this country, not just recently, but for decades and decades. You've got trials going on right now in this country that touch on race and inequality and division. And some of these trials are going in ways that are making those people feel even more frustrated. What gives the United States the moral position and... and, and, and and moment to be able to call other democracies and say, hey, let's, let's all talk about, you know, how to keep this right, when we're not even getting it right. We're not getting it right. We never have gotten it perfectly. There's a dark underside of American history, okay? R racism, the legacy of slavery, that's real. But so are our founding principles, the good ones. And American history is a history of a struggle between the, the good side and the bad side. So let's assume you're right in everything you say. Uh, I think you pretty much are. What do we do about that? Give up? Right. Retreat? Say we're unworthy? We were even worse in 1945 when we, when we destroyed Nazism. Hmm. Does that, we were worse. We had institutionalized racism, legal racism in the United States, and yet we set out to make a better world, a, a more democratic world, and we often succeeded. Well, before I jump to Elise, I want to get David Adler in this. David, you've written a, an article and you said Biden wants to convene an international summit of democracy. He shouldn't. So why shouldn't he? What, what, what is the reason that you think that this is folly? So I want to take your critique about moral authority a step further to say that we have a real crisis of credibility 
with the U.S., as Joe Biden would have it, taking uh, its seat at the head of the table discussing democracy. And that's not just because of legacies of institutionalized racism. That's because on the key priorities of this administration, of Secretary uh, of State Anthony Binkley in particular, like corruption, the U.S. is a primary actor. We are the central node, for example, in a network of illegal and kleptocratic finance that passes through our financial system on a route to financing. Those autocratic regimes that the ambassador points out are rising around the world. So we have a real crisis of credibility, not just looking at January 6, but also looking at betrayed campaign promises. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden promised to stop offshore drilling and fracking. Now is leading the largest auction of uh, a territory, of U.S. territory, to, to enable offshore drilling. So when it comes to either the domestic promise or its relationship between the U.S. and those autocrats abroad, that's deeply problematic. And I don't think that we are in a position to be lecturing other, other, um, other governments. So there's a crisis of credibility at home. There's a crisis of the club model abroad. You mentioned 100 leaders coming to the table. Why those 100? We've been here before in the Cold War, dividing the world between the free world and what we used to call the slave world of the Soviet Union. Does that Cold War logic work? This is something that I hope to debate today. But one thing that I could point out is our systematic inability to pick good allies abroad. Secretary of State Antony Blinken recently in Latin America giving a speech for how we can defend democracy in the Americas ahead of this summit. Where is he doing it? He's doing it in Quito, where Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso had just introduced a state of emergency to crack down on protesters and distract from the revelations in the Pandora Papers of his extensive tax evasion, and later in Bogota, in Colombia, praising, lavishing praise on President Ivan Duque, who stands accused of enabling, facilitating, and supporting massacres of indigenous, peasant, and social movement leaders. So we've got a crisis of credibility abroad, clubs, the club model, uh, sorry, credibility at home, the club model abroad, and just as importantly, our model of cooperation across. The U.S. continues to insist on dominating multilateral fora, which could be avenues for the flourishing of democracy. That's, of course, the Organization of American States, which has led those coup efforts in places like Bolivia and earlier in Haiti, but as well as WHO. You know, we're, we're confronting a pandemic that doesn't care about whether you're a democracy or whether you're a communist regime. And yet we continue to insist on protecting our patents against global vaccination efforts, preventing the WHO from engaging with Russian, Chinese, Cuban vaccine candidates. These are things that require us to look beyond that division between free right. world and slave world, right. democratic and non-democratic. And so for those reasons, I think it's not a helpful framing. And I'm curious to hear from other people on the panel about what we can achieve within those constraints. But I remain very pessimistic about its prospects for those reasons. Well, well, Elise Labatt, in, 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 a, in a great piece in Foreign Policy magazine, um, writes that, you know, and I, and I agree with her, that one of the assets that the United States had in decades of struggle during the Cold War, et cetera, were, it, were the characteristics of it as a democracy. We can debate how, how hypocritical elements of that were, but that was part of the package uh, of America's engagement with the world. Um, and you write that that is what we need to bring back to deal with China, Elise. That you, you, so I'd love to kind of hear, we've just had kind of two, you know, different perspectives here, both kind of realistically. This is a high-stakes moment for Joe Biden. But tell us your views. It's a high-stakes moment. And um, Dan and I um, debate this all of the time about, and, and David makes a good uh, case about whether we should be having this at all, considering America is not leading with its values. Yes, Joe Biden is speaking about you know, the importance of American values. And these are organizing principles. Um, you know, the famous um, foreign policy practitioner, Les Gal Gelb, used to say, former chairman um, emeritus of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations, used to say, positioning without taking a position. And so these are grand organizing principles. But when you see America, whether it's abroad, you know, in Afghanistan, not defending democracy there mm. with the withdrawal, um, look at Syria, look at Cuba, where there are protesters in um, the streets. Um, they're not only protesting um, freedom, which they've been doing um, traditionally for years, but they're all pro protesting their lack of food at a time where, you know, Cuba's ex um, experiencing a huge humanitarian crisis, yet President Biden is cracking down and, and um, imposing new sanctions, even tougher, I think, than, uh, than President Trump was at some point. So... Here at home, um, you see all the voter rights bills that are, that are being passed across the country. You mentioned some of these trials. Um, America is not a democracy right now. Mm. And when you look, you know, you know Dan knows, you know, the, the dangers of communism, of fascism. He's experienced it. He's written about it. 
um, a lot of Americans don't know about this arcane system. And the, when we have the shrinking of the middle class here at home, neither party is delivered. And they're saying, well, you know, let's give authoritarianism a shot. And I, I'm afraid that we're looking towards this new revolutionary system where Americans are increasingly saying authoritarianism might not be so bad. So should Joe Biden be organizing the world and saying, yes, we should be um, talking about democratic principles? Yes. But it's supporting freedom fighters, whether it's, you know, abroad or whether it's at home. Right. It's about supporting the people that are fighting for democracy instead of these organizing principles. Um, democracy is work. It's not just an idea. And I'm afraid we're promoting the idea and not doing the hard work but, to but, safeguard it. But let me ask you a question, Elise and Dan and, and David. I hear that argument a lot, and I have seen it a lot. I've seen it in places where I was, you know, uh, uh, having sort of dueling op-eds with Anne-Marie Slaughter before uh, actions were taken in Libya, um, that it's easy for people to say, support the freedom fighters in that moment of passion. But when it comes to real institution building, when it comes to the costs of helping another nation build the institutions that it needs to build to deliver something there. And it's sometimes very hard to do it. Or, or the forces that are released, like in a place like Libya, that are so hard. I find right now America in strategic contraction. So when you sort of look at that moment of saying, hey, rah, rah, let's go help you know, other nations you know, engage in revolutions and fight for their rights, but at the same time, we're nowhere to be found when it comes to supporting them. Tell me where I'm wrong. No, you're 100% right. But it's not, a, it's not a binary choice of right. one or the other. Okay, I think you're 100% right, whether it's in Iraq, whether yeah. it's in Afghanistan, whether it's in Libya, as you say. Yeah. The U.S. is really good about, um, you know, going in and, and, you know, getting rid of the dictator. But then what happens about that political will to stay there and help build the state? And everyone says, oh, no, we're not into nation building. Mm. It's not about nation building. It's about mm. state building and helping countries govern themselves. Right. The U.S. has never been good about building those institutions um, that teach people about those. And it doesn't have to be a Jeffersonian democracy, but about right. those, you know, democratic small d principles mm. um, that are able to safeguard democracy over the long term. But again, it's not a binary choice. It can't be this pie. Right. It's, it can't be this pie in the sky, um, you know, idea. It starts at the grassroots level. And I think, you know, and I'd right. love to see what Dan says about the tech aspect. But at the grassroots level, it's not being done. Dan? I, so do we support democracy better, as Elise says, in which case I'm all in? Or do we not support it at all because we're flawed, mm. as David suggested? I spent many years of my career working with freedom fighters, democratic activists in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. They believe in America. They still do. The Belarusian democracy movement mm. believes that America has, stands for something that's good. They're not cynical. Now, all of our mistakes, yeah, we better own them. Mm. But does that mean we give up and simply say that because we are flawed, we will leave the field open to the Putins and the Xi's and the autocrats. Right. And I say we can do better. Now, David made a suggestion that I think is spot on, which is focus on anti-corruption, which happens to be one of the three pillars of Biden's summit for democracy. We need to do better. Mm -hmm. Dirty money flows to us. Um, the, and I know that's going to be a big, a big part of the focus. That's right, and it, it should. It, we it, need to clean up our act and do it with the Europeans and the British and others, and the Democracy Summit can help. So let's talk about ways we can help instead of wringing our hands and right. talking about our, you know, our endless imperfections. Mm. If we were worse in 1945, right. we, we had legal segregation in this country. Does that mean we shouldn't have supported mm. democracy in Europe because we were flawed? David Adler. David? Yeah. 
I think we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, I think, you know, before we can speak about state building, institutional construction, those are all, you know, mostly military options. I think we can speak about some really simple, basic institutional issues that are at stake here. I want to be clear uh, with, with Dan that I don't oppose our efforts to support democratic forces around the world. I, too, in my capacity as general coordinator of this organization, have the chance to work with those social movements, those political parties, those trade unions who are standing up for their rights around the world. What we're talking about is putting the focus back on the basic hypocritical dimensions of our relationship to the concept of democracy and its expression on the global stage. Mm. I gave the example of uh, our financial system being the primary hub for kleptocratic finance around the world. That should be the first thing that we're focusing on. And my dear friend Ben Judah has a nice piece out in the Atlantic on Joe Biden's uh, administrations basically U-turn on kleptocracy and refusal to take those issues seriously in the, the first years of the administration. But let's go one step further. What is democracy but the respect for the rule of law, domestic and abroad? The U.S. continues to be engaged in a systematic violation of international law. Our sanctions regime is illegal. We mentioned Cuba, but the th same thing extends around the world. Those are unilateral coercive measures, which right. in the eyes of the world are illegal and condemned on the global stage. How can we be a reasonable manager, let alone promoter of democracy, right. if right. we are sitting in our high chair at the Security Council and refusing to respect even those basic tenets? So I'm not saying we shouldn't stand up for democracy. Right. I'm saying let's sit down and have a really clear and an honest conversation about what the U.S. relationship to democracy is at home and abroad, and let's really, really start there. Now, uh, and then we can move toward the commitments of other countries who are also in attendance. I appreciate that perspective, I, but I got to throw out something here that, that I'm really interested in you guys um, responding to, which is, you know, we always have to look at who got invited, who didn't get invited. There's going to be 109 nations um, uh, supposedly in this, but those that didn't get invited include Thailand, Vietnam, Turkey. Hungary and Egypt and Iran. And, you know, you can make various cases why they didn't come in. I would say, you know, look, I saw the mayor of Istanbul, you know, beat back the, the party of Erdogan. So you yep. can look at whatever democracy means. If you're looking just at leaders and the leader's behavior, then I'm not sure that we would have been invited to the summit of democracies under the Trump administration, but we'll get, we'll get beyond that. But you, they invited the Philippines. They invited Poland. They invited India. They invited Israel and Iraq. And, and... I think part of the question comes in, in, the, in, this, in this broadside, Dan, um, what, did we set the bar too low? Did we set the bar in yeah. too confused a way? I mean, I, I, and I also find it odd, you know, along the line that David just shared about Ecuador and Tony Blinken, you know, Secretary of State Tony Blinken being, being down there and talking about, we were also saying glowing things about Turkey. Uh, recently and, you know, it taking in refugees and doing a variety of things and how it was great to stand by our alliance. And Turkey is a NATO member. Hungary is a member of Europe and they've both been excluded. So I'm just yep. interested in the, the, the hypocrisies that we will all have to talk about uh, during well, this, this summit. Well, wherever the administration drew the line with invitations, it would face criticism. In fact, the issue of invitations could have sunk the, the whole summit. So. I have some sympathy for the administration. They erred on the side of inviting lots in, including flawed democracies. And you could argue, so are we, so that's appropriate. I think one way to avoid obsessing about which governments are invited is to also invite democracy activists. Hmm. Like, the Philippines are invited. But how about giving the floor to the journalist who won the Nobel Prize for Journalism? Right. Hmm? as a way of saying, yeah, Philippines is invited, and look who speaks for the Philippines. Russia's not invited, but how about inviting somebody from the democratic opposition to speak for Russian society? Oh, by the way, I have to go back. Um, U.S. Well, is there any sense that the administration is doing that? I have not heard that they're, they're doing that. Uh, I think they are. Huh. I don't know for sure. At least do you know? They'd better be. Um, I have. They're still. I, I don't think the agenda is really set. I mean, the guest list might have gone out. I, I mean, still, this is in a couple think, of weeks. Yeah, I still think they're <laughs> trying to figure out what they want to do. And I think Dan makes a really important point. Right. Um, is this just going to be. And I think it goes to the whole organizing idea of what we're talking about and whether this should be what kind of conference this should be. Should this be a bunch of leaders getting together and making a big declaration and we're all standing by democracy? Or should this be trying to find, A, highlighting people who are fighting for democracy, 
And B, as David said, um, this can't be just a big declaration. Well, and David, this has to be things that yeah. come out of this conference. There have to be deliverables. There have to be commitments right. that come out of this conference to actually fight for democracy. Well, I mean, David Adler also makes a piece. And I, I, I really enjoyed your piece in The Guardian, David. But you made a point, I thought, in your article about this summit becoming a way that institutionally turns a blind eye against horrific behavior that other leaders, Rodrigo Duterte in the Philippines is taking against his own people. Your th I don't want to speak for you, but share us your, with us your thoughts. Well, I think the exclusion principle speaks to, uh, we don't have to defend this summit. I mean, I think it's a nice idea in principle, but I think that these kinds of flaws do right. pose let's say, mortal questions for its productivity. The sense in which Duterte is at the table, but Erdogan is not, mm. isn't just an arbitrary division. I, I'm with Dan. I have a lot of sympathy. How are we going to draw a line in the middle of the world? Right. Doesn't that mean that maybe we shouldn't be drawing a line in the middle of the world? The way I see it, for example, is that COP26, the UN Conference on Climate Change, that's also a summit for democracy. Those are also avenues, moments, when democracies around the world should be coming together and fortifying their principles and their capacity to deliver on behalf of the peoples of the world. Climate change is an issue of democracy. We know that because we know it can cause instability, force migration, right. all these issues that lead to the same rise of authoritarian tactics. So my point is to say, you know, shoving the issue of democratic principles and values into a summit so flawed in its architecture and so vague in its goals is less important to me than having that value, having right. a, the Summit for Democracy vision plug into actually existing multilateral right. fora where we kind of refuse to give up the goat in a way. Thank you. Let, we're we're in our last in. minute, Dan. Let me Dan, jump so, in on that. Yeah, go ahead. One minute. Okay. David has a point. I'd like to see the Summit of Democracy really fire up people to work in other institutions on climate change, on tech democracy, on fighting corruption. The summit can give impetus to people, to governments working in different fora to advance the things David was talking about. He's got a point, but it's a good idea. Right. I, worked in, I worked in government for 40 years. Imperfection is inevitable. Flaws are inevitable. Right. The question is, are you moving in the right direction? And I think the Biden administration with this Summit for Democracy right. is. It can't Elise, just be, we, it we can't have, just we, be Let election. me just finish. We have 30 seconds yeah. left. I want to give you, you made a profound statement. You said right now America is really not a democracy. I'd like to know in a scale of 1 to 10 where we are, because I don't know how you communicate a new uh, uh, air of democracy around the world and, until America straightens out to its own house. But where do you think America is in this moment? I don't Real know quick. if we can look at a 1 to 10 and say, oh, we're a 8 and a half. I think the thing about what is a democracy, right? A democracy is when people are practicing democratic principles. Right. And we're not doing that. Democracies are more than an election. Yes, we had a flawed election. Right. Okay, but we need to be practicing it. And when we look at what's happening across the country with voter bills, with right. all of these... Um, clamp down on thank voter you. rights. Thank I think you. that's where we Elise, need to be. Elise, thank you. Ambassador Daniel Fried, columnist Elise Labatt, and political economist David Adler, thank you so much for your candor. This is a great conversation. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. So what's the bottom line? Is America the last place that should be preaching about democracy? A lot has been done in the name of democracy that just hasn't delivered for Americans or for folks around the world. The rich are getting obscenely richer, while many are really struggling. In this country, you can be sidelined easily if you're born into the wrong zip code or skin color. Democracy isn't just about the vote. How about protecting minorities and the weak? How about equal rights for everyone? Biden is right that dictatorship is not the answer, but it's disingenuous to gather heads of state in a big virtual conference as if there's a secret handshake that fixes these problems. Instead of that, America needs to get its own house in order and deliver a democracy that's real and that brings justice and opportunity for all Americans. The U.S. has a lot of work to do, and we need to be a lot more honest about that, both at home and abroad. And that's the bottom line.